One thing I wanted to say is that you'll be using V6 more than you think. Sure. And if you have a MacBook at home um, uh, and have another Mac, they will be communicating over Link Local IPv6 automatically. If you have an electric vehicle, if you plug it into a fast charging system, the car will communicate over IP using IPv6 Link Local with the fast charger to do communication and then actually initiate the charging process. Wow. Maybe, you know, we need uh, an IPv6 day when everybody enables V6 on their gas network. Maybe. That's a thing indeed. Yeah. V6 is completely ready in the backbone, front to back. It's all done. I, I spoke with an engineer, but he said, for me, it's just flipping a switch and it's turned on. He said, but there, you know, there's a business reason why we're not turning it on because the back office and the billing system doesn't support it yet. And there's no priority to implement it. Right. Networking wise, he said, I can turn it on tomorrow. Today, we explore a topic that powers the plumbing of the internet itself, IPv6. And to guide us in this journey, we have a passionate expert and advocate for IPv6, Vito Den Hollander. As chief technical officer of a major web hosting provider, Vito lives and breathes networks. He has been focused on transitioning fully to IPv6 for over 15 years. But why? In our discussion, Vito breaks down both the technical and ethical drivers behind moving the internet to this new addressing scheme. Vito makes a compelling case that the transition to IPv6 is long overdue. Vito's passion for routing combined with his clear-sighted vision for a better internet with IPv6 is frankly inspiring. The future may already be here, hidden just beneath the surface. So let's gain insight from a leader at the vanguard of IPv6 adoption to understand how this next generation protocol that's actually been around for years promises to shape our digital lives. The journey to an upgraded internet starts now. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Vito Den Hollander. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have you on the podcast uh, with me today, Vito. Uh, and uh, today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about IPv6, which is a passion of yours. Um, so first of all, maybe you could spend just a moment introducing yourself uh, and how you got here. Like, what do you do in the world uh, and why are you so interested, therefore, in IPv6? Yeah, so I... Although I'm not wearing a suit today, I, I always call myself a nerd in a suit. And that's, uh, it all started 20 years ago or more than 20 years ago. I started tinkering computers and I found the internet a very interesting place. So back in the days in 2002, 2003, there was ADSL coming available at my house. And I, I told my mother, uh, my parents are divorced. So I told my mother, I said, mom, I want to get ADSL. But it was a hundred guilder, which was the currency we were using uh, back in the days then a month, which is a lot of money. And uh, she said, well, if you want to have internet, you'll go work for it. So I started working at the local supermarket to actually do a fourth an internet connection. And that's where I actually started to go on towards the internet. It all started, of course, with the modem dialing in, but it was way too slow. I wanted to have fast internet. So I was a cool kid on the block having ADSL. I think it was a half megabit downstream or something and 120 kilobit upstream. That's what it all started with more than 20 years ago, um, discovering the internet. And um, ever since, I found it a very intriguing and interesting place on how you can suddenly communicate with everybody around the world. So for me, it was mainly about communication, being able to talk to people from all around the planet. And I was just super interested in how it worked. I wanted to build my own servers at home. I started hosting my own website on that ADSL connection, which was 120 kilobit upstream, which is super slow, but it worked. So, um, and from there, um, I accidentally run into starting my own hosting company. Oh, you start building websites and people want hosting and you say, I can do it myself. So you have your first server, then you search for a data center and uh, which is completely new stuff for you. So you're building your first server. Actually, you have your father buying a server for you on his company because huh. you need to have somebody uh, buying the equipment. And that's where it all started. It started to grow. And then suddenly you have a thousand customers and it keeps growing and growing and growing. And um, nowadays I'm, I'm CTO of, uh, of Your Online. We host a couple of million websites uh, with various European companies, which we have. But for me, the journey started more than 20 years ago being a techie, knowing everything about Linux, routing, um, at IP addressing, and mainly IPv6. 
Uh, that's uh, my passion. Yeah, I feel like, you know, having talked to a lot of um, hosting company owners over the last 20 years, uh, that many people kind of got into the field accidentally. They just, you know, they were the tech person. They started hosting some websites for friends. And then the next thing, you know, there's a day, you know, they got a data center and everything's kind of growing like crazy. Uh, what a story. So you really got started working at a supermarket in order to pay for an ADSL connection at your mom's house so that you could get on the internet and communicate with people. Yeah, that was, uh, that was my main driver. Yeah. So that's where it all started. Yeah. And, and so, um, why the passion for IPv6? Uh, because you have, uh, been talking about IPv6 for quite a while now. Uh, you have a website where you speak about your passion for IPv6. You're very active in pushing IPv6 in your own hosting company. Um, uh, we, I think the, our audience will know sort of generally what IPv6 is, but my, my feeling is that IPv6 has been this great technology that's been around for a really long time. And yet, uh, to the extent that it has caught on, it's not something that people talk about or are aware of a great deal. Uh, it's kind of behind the scenes, you know, why are you so interested in it? If you, if you go back to the original idea of the internet between universities, it was that computers could communicate with other computers. So they needed an IP address to communicate. And if you go back, I, when I was studying at university, my if I would go on the Wi-Fi, I would get a public IPv4 address and also a V6 address back in the days running the university. So I, of course, there was a firewall in between, but my, my computer had a direct connection to the internet to communicate. And um, as I started co-locating my first server in, uh, in in a data center, I said, can I get some more V4 addresses? Because for SSL back in the days, without SNI, you needed more addresses. And I'm talking about SSL, not TLS, you know, back SSL. And they told me, oh, yeah, those, are, those are scarce and you cannot go, get a lot of addresses. You need to have a really good reason for using these. I'm like, what? what? Why are we talking about it's, it's an address? So I started to get confronted with the shortage already back in 2005 that it was it was a problem getting more addresses if, if, as you wanted. And then I found this thing, IPv6, and I don't know exactly what it was, but I have a, let's say, uh, a passion for routing in general, and I dislike network address translation or net. I, I, I don't... People saying, I have my private network and there's the internet. Well, for me working in the hosting industry, Everything is the internet. I don't consider something where it's my private network or going on the internet. Every server is part of the internet being able to communicate. And it's, it, it, it just feels like a hack using that. It's actually a hack for address shortage. But somehow this got into the minds of a lot of people and I just never liked it. Uh, so you uh, mentioned uh, network address translation, right? And, and for those people who are not super familiar with NAT, um, it's basically a hack where you have a private IP network inside of your organization or your home uh, with addresses that are kind of unroutable on the internet. And then your firewall or your router uh, uses, but remaps the uh, ports uh, on TCP and UDP connections in order to communicate with the outside world and then select the correct private network address to talk to. Uh, and it's all very seamless now. But yeah, it, it's something that we all take so much for granted. Uh, IPv6 obviously really changes that, right? Because there are so many IPs available that you could give each device in your house a billion IP addresses if you wanted to, and we would never run out. Um, uh, so, okay, so interesting. So you're, one of your uh, points of interest in IPv6 was it was a way of getting rid of this kind of gross hack. Yeah, uh, it, it was. Yeah. It was. So I, um, I think back in 2008, I already started complaining at my ISP that I wanted to get IPv6 at home. Well, it was impossible. They they were working on it. It would come later. Actually, it came five years later. So I'd use the tunnel to my house to get the IPv6. And in the data center, I was by then already being able to route IPv6. So on the office, on my house, I had IPv6. So if I would have my laptop at home, by back in the day, I still had a, a workstation at, at the office. I could just SSH to my laptop, which was at home, and, and access data. 
if it was online on the Wi-Fi. It, it, it's as easy as that. And with Net, you need to forward ports to the, the your router. In my case, I just set the firewall open to allow port 22. And I could reach my laptop, which I think is just super awesome. Yeah, without any kind of port manipulation. Um, yeah. See, I I think I'm a little older than you. Uh, and uh, I come from a time uh, when, uh, you know, in the 1990s, V4 was all you had. Like there was a, there wasn't V6 on the horizon. And, and we all got very used to SSH tunneling into machines behind firewalls and stuff. And I, uh, it has never occurred to me that I could just get into one of my machines at home directly using its IP address. Like that is, it almost feels like that would be dangerous. You know, I kind of yeah. like value the, <laughs> you know, you True, know. true. And there's a difference here because Net has the side effect of being some sort of firewall, but every router you have at home is, it's it's not, it's a router and a firewall in, in, in one. And this is, I think, misunderstood by a lot of people that routing is not the same as firewalling. So if you look at data center grade routers, they can only route packets. They cannot firewall yeah. because they, they are meant for high capacity, high performance, so low latency, forwarding packets. That's all they do. But the CPEs or the consumer um, uh, devices, they um, can also do firewalling. And on V6, they can just say no inbound connections, period. Right. And that's what they do by default. That's what the RFCs and the recommendations say, huh. that a end user's firewall on its uh, router should just block all incoming connections. The same happens to your Windows laptop or your Mac laptop. It just blocks any incoming connections on the firewall on the host. I must say, I uh, I have a little bit of recent experience with IPv6 at home. Um, our network provider has been doing IPv6 for a few years. Uh, and at home, I have a PFSense uh, router PF, yeah, I guess it's a PF Sense router slash firewall, um, and they make it very easy to enable IPv6 in PF Sense. It just kind of starts working, and uh, and so sure enough, I look at my devices, and they're issued a real IPv6 routable address on the internet. Yeah, there, yeah. you know, it was like, oh, well, this is interesting. Yeah. So if, if the firewall by default blocks any incoming packets, you cannot reach them. But if you would say, I do allow port 22 from this right. source or from any source towards this address or all addresses, you could SSH to your devices in your network. Huh. And then suddenly, if you have, you, you mentioned before we started recording, you have a gigabit connection at home. You could run your own servers at home. If you have a synchronous gigabit connection, you could just have a 19 inch rack with servers, IPv6 addresses and you're good to go. Of course, the redundancy is less than being in a data center, but it is part of the internet. I suppose. I, I suppose it's easy to lose sight of that fact. You know, you you don't think of a home network as somewhere where you would want to serve something, but you know, home connections are pretty good now uh, in, in comparison to how they were uh, ten to twenty years ago. You mentioned you only had 128 kilobits of upstream on your ADSL line. I bet that's not the case, right? You know anymore? No, no, far <laughs> from that. So, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll get fiber at my home in the next quarter. So then I'll have a gigabit synchronous here, and yeah, that, that I could theoretically run service at home and and do some hosting on on them, and it could be all kinds of appliances running on a V6 address. So I, I think we we need this freedom where it's no longer required to just have V4 on, on the internet. So IPv6 is kind of like a an issue of freedom. Uh, for you, what motivates that? So it is um, going back to when it started with the internet. It's a way to communicate with with the world. And if you look at the Western world and then maybe North America, so the United States and Europe, we were pretty um, early with the internet. So we got allocated a lot of before addresses. But if you are going to continents like Africa or South America or going to Asia and looking at the population, you know, in, in, in India, which is over a billion people, uh, and, and, and the same, of course, uh, goes for China, um, they don't have the amount of addresses per person as we have. So we had this luxury of having enough V4 addresses. As I said, my university was able to give me a V4 address on my laptop on the Wi-Fi. But now, if you want to start a company, even in the United States or in, in Europe, you want to start a hosting company and you want to compete, you need V4 addresses. 
Hmm. And this is maybe even one of the, I, I, would, I, I don't proof for this, nor I think this is a conspiracy, but there is a competition problem here. If you want to start competition with a cloud provider or hosting provider, you have a problem. You need to have V4 addresses. So that's an investment you need to make. But what are you investing in? I, uh, it's not tangible. It's not a real. Yeah, it's an asset, of course, on your asset list of your of your company. But it's why should you pay for addresses on the internet? It's and yeah, then going to a continent Africa where we are expecting the population to be growing much faster, while in the United States and Europe we actually have a declining population. Uh, it's 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 sounds pretty weird, right? That we have uh, all these V four addresses. And we're not for, we're not even there yet. We're getting the whole population globally connected on the internet. There are so many people who are not aligned yet, um, and I think a lot of people forget this that the internet is bigger than the small bubble they are using. So it's it's almost like a IPv6 enables there to be a uh, a fairer internet, a more equitable internet that's accessible to the people who are just getting online now. Uh, in in parts of the world that we're not so fortunate um, economically to uh, be among the lucky ones who got IPv4 addresses. It, it, yeah, yeah, that's the case. That's the case. Right. I recently was talking with somebody who wanted to uh, start some hosting with his business, but the first thing he needed to do was buy IPv4 addresses for forty thousand euros. So that's about forty thousand right. dollars. That's an investment he needed to make. For what? You could also spend that on equipment and actually do something right. with the equipment. So that's um, it, it doesn't sound really fair. I remember when um, Mail Channels bought a Slash 20. Uh, it was a long time ago, maybe 2014. Uh, and that block of addresses cost us about $25,000 uh, for 4,000 addresses, right? So it was a cost of six bucks or something per address. Nowadays, the price is a lot higher for IPv4. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't, I'd actually don't know what it is, but I know the last time I looked, it was it was thirty dollars or something per IP. I, w- I was actually checking two weeks ago. It, it's hovering between thirty-five and forty dollars per address. Right. I mean, so and- that might end up being the best investment we ever made. You know, <laughs> if we could only sell those addresses one day. Yeah, but then we get to the capitalism on this world. I don't want to make this a conversation about capitalism, but there we go again about the inequality on the internet where, so if you have money, you can run a company. You even have an asset which makes you more money. So people just sit on the addresses hoping that they uh, become more valuable and then they sell them to a startup company which probably needs that money to pay salary or just invest in the company. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that happened in the IP address world recently is Amazon Web Services changed their pricing model. Uh, and if you want a public IP v4 address, you now have to pay a, a fee every month to use that address. It used to be that uh, so-called elastic IPs, you would pay a fee if you didn't use it, if it was just sitting idle. But uh, the, nobody thought about the cost of IPs on AWS, but now they're actually charging, I think it's about three dollars per month billed hourly, um, and that's that's real money. Uh, but Amazon, and you know, in Amazon's defense, they said, "Well, you know, IPs are running out. We we have to pay an increasing amount of money to acquire IPv4 addresses, and we want to kind of, you know, uh, communicate to people using our services that this is a, an expensive asset, and maybe they should be thinking about alternatives. One of which, of course, is IPv6." Yeah, and Azure is doing the same nowadays. And this price will probably keep going up in the coming years that V4 addresses on cloud environments or at other providers become uh, more expensive. And it's, um, I think it's a good thing. It, it should erase the awareness so this then also start reaching the CEO and CFO of companies that these addresses actually becoming, um, it's becoming a cost. Right. Um, yeah, so uh, let's let's get into a discussion of, uh, of the, you know, the tech, some of the technical factors involved in IPv6. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that network address translation is, is something that just doesn't feel quite right to you. Uh, you know, can you elaborate on why you think uh, NAT is detrimental for the internet? Uh, why getting away from NAT and having all machines be uh, directly addressable would be a great improvement over what we have today? 
So we can do peer-to-peer connections again. I think that that's something we're lacking at the moment. So I mentioned, of course, running servers at home, that's something. But what's the difference between a laptop and a 19-inch device somewhere in a data center? They're both computers with a CPU, a a bit of memory, and they need to communicate. Now, um, peer-to-peer connections allow for video connections, so video calling um, directly between devices instead of routing it via a server. The server adds a, a delay, it adds a privacy issue where data then suddenly goes via service, which is not needed. And having the ability to create peer-to-peer connections brings the internet back on how it was designed. We're getting a more centralized place, so the internet is becoming more centralized where we have Everybody's using Cloudflare and Google's DNS without thinking about it. We we have this great system called DNS where you can have different kinds of DNS servers. It's it's beautiful, but we're all using a centralized. And Cloudflare, although they are building great technology, having all the websites being routed through Cloudflare, it, it, is that something we want? And this is not about a peer-to-peer, but the, the, the idea behind it, being able to communicate peer-to-peer. If I want to contact my, uh, my oven in my kitchen, I can remotely turn on my oven. But that actually goes via a server of the company on, on cloud somewhere. So my oven connects to the cloud and then my app connects to, to the cloud again. Why should my app on my phone not be able to connect to my oven directly and just say, turn it on? There's a firewall in the middle. There's authentication. All these kinds of things. Um, uh, we're, we're hacking around that. Uh, that's what they're all doing. But we should be able to connect to those, those devices directly. I see. So there's actually... It, it would sort of greatly simplify the deployment of uh, services that have to connect with devices within, you know, private networks, formerly private networks. Uh, and you give the example of a uh, video calling uh, improved privacy because the packets don't have to ping off of a server that's, you know, redirecting them. I mean, even if uh, even if a connection uh, between the devices is end to end encrypted there's still a, a server in the middle that knows that there is a connection, right? And, yeah. and you know, in, in some instances, just the existence of a communication channel between two people can be enough to be a threat to their privacy. Uh, if you're a journalist working in uh, a part of the world where you know you're being monitored and might be threatened, uh, you don't want to tip off the local government that you're having a call with uh, a source, for example, you know, all they have to do, they don't have to know what you're talking about, but the, the mere existence, if they can track those packets, is, is enough to cause problems. So IPv6 could alleviate that sort of problem. Indeed, indeed. And also routing can do its thing again, just route packets via the shortest route between two devices somewhere on the internet. And that's that's the beauty. So if I, let's say I want to um, right now communicate with uh, my neighbor who might have the same ISP, this traffic, if I'm using some file sharing service, goes to a server somewhere on the internet and that goes back again, why should that traffic leave the network of my ISP? Because it's my neighbor's house. So the traffic should be able to go between our houses directly on in the network hey. of the ISP, never go outside that network. And these are the things people are not thinking about. There's a server somewhere in the middle uh, doing stuff. And if that's turned off or, or somebody's sniffing there, it's just... I don't think that's needed, and that's why I, I have a dislike against NAT. Um, but we have a generation which grew up with NAT not knowing anything else than NAT, thinking that outside the NAT, though there's the dangerous internet, the, the dark internet starting where everything uh, bad happens. Well, I can tell you, I've been running web servers on the internet for 20 years with public IPv4 addresses. It's not that scary. Yeah. I, so you 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 know, one thing that comes to mind is I think people consider that NAT provides a layer of security by hiding devices behind uh, a, you know, within a private network that's not addressable from the internet. Uh, what do you think about that? Is it is that, uh, if we move to IPv6, uh, is that really going to erode a level of security that we have because uh, of the obscurity created by NAT? Yes. Yeah, so the obscurity of your home connection still has a v4 address so that is traceable back to your house you cannot know if it was your laptop or your phone going outside but it's still you, you, your home with v, v6 your laptop your mobile phone anything you use will get a v6 address so technically it is traceable back but only only you know which address belongs to your phone so, but also v6 has something called privacy extension so the subnet so the prefix 
will stay the same, but the devices will generate a new address every period, which is a few hours. So the suffix of the address will change. So you're not able to track uh, the device. My phone will have an address now, and in a few hours, it will have a different address. The prefix, which is identifiable back to my house, that is uh, that stays the same, but the suffix changes. I don't know what the address of my phone is, nor my laptop. And... No. Wow. So privacy-wise, um, I actually think it's a good thing because from my house, I can now start tracking which devices are sending traffic to the internet and I get it back. But on the internet, nobody knows if it's a phone, a laptop, nobody. So why do you, you know, it seems like a lot of people who should know about this stuff don't know about it. Why do you think uh, so many, you know, network engineers uh, who work on the plumbing of the internet are just naive about uh, features like uh, the privacy feature of IPv6? If you look at the, the network engineers running the core internet, so all the BGP routers, they know how V6 works. They set up V6 um, sessions, all the day BGP sessions. You see all the traffic flowing. It, but I think it really comes down to education. If you look at any education on universities on, on, uh, or maybe on, on high schools where they start something with IT, they start with learning 10.0.0.0 as an address. And I say, we should turn this around. We should just start education with V6 only. That's how you start educating people. This is the internet. I, this is how it works. I'll be honest with you. Um, I studied networking, uh, computer networking, probably in 1997 uh, in university. And definitely IPv4 was the most that we uh, you know, learned about at that time, obviously. Um, still to this day, the funny letters and you know, colons separating uh, the digits in a IPv6 address confuse me, and I don't really understand how it all works. To me, it's uh, I, I haven't taken the time to learn how IPv6 really actually works. I know that there's some really clever stuff going on, uh, but I, I think the issue you're talking about is a real one. Like, how do you re-educate a whole generation of people who have learned about networking to understand IPv6 and what makes it cool and how we can use it. It's like this tool that's sitting there. It's, as you said, the the core network engineers, they know what's going on. They use IPv6 all day long, but that hasn't flowed out to the edges to people who are less specialized. Yeah, that's that's where it's lacking. And the, the fundamental part is that people are not being taught routing anymore. So they're being taught how address translation works. So you have your private network, then your router has a public address, you do translation, and that's it. But if you really learn again how routing works, how the internet was designed, because that's how V6 works. It works on a routing basis, not on an address translation basis. Education is all about address translation. It's no longer about routing. Uh, and I think there, there it's lacking. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I sort of am, I'm having these dim flashbacks of computer networking class uh, in the 90s. And I'm remembering, you know, border gateway protocol and uh, and even earlier iterations of how routers are meant to discover the correct path, uh, you know, pruning the trees of, on a graph and stuff like uh I think you're you're right. Most people think of NAT, and then they think of this magic in the middle that just makes the packets go to the right place, right? Yeah. But we're not, as you said, we're not teaching about all of that magic, which is really important. It, it is the magic of routing. And, and so people think about their home router, which does a bit of translation, or somewhere in a data center, they'll put a router in the middle, which then does the network address translation, all these servers in the back. It might be a load balancer, which accepts incoming port 80 or 443, and then load balances using address translation over a bunch of web servers in the back. And um, surprise, you can do the same with V6, having a load balancer, balancing over V6 addresses with just routing. Uh, but it's just it's, it's it's forgotten by by a lot of people that this is a possibility. So, huh. Yeah, so I think it's a fundamental educational problem, and the um, resistance I see against V six is one I say is that people want change as long as nothing changes. Yeah. So there there's this feeling for them that they they I think in the back of their mind they want to implement V six. But they just simply don't know how to implement v6 so then they'll dislike it and come up with arguments saying why it's not possible while it is it is possible they but they would like to do so 
However, it's a fundamental, not, not, not even fundamentally, but it, it's a different way of looking at a network. So carrier grade network address translation or CG uh, NAT, CGNAT, um, that's a stopgap measure that, they, that the industry has come up with uh, to delay the deployment of IPv6 uh, for as long as possible. Um, can you talk a little bit about CGNAT, um, some of the problems uh, that it causes for the internet and, and what you think should be done with it? Yeah. I think it should die tomorrow. That's that's my uh, my <laughs> honest answer. So sorry for using that word, but it, it's it's horrible. No, but the uh, it is is it's a plaster measure again. You know, putting a band aid over something uh, because you don't want to feel, fix the real problem. CGNAT has um, a drawback is that a, a couple of thousands of users or hundreds of users could be sharing the same public P4 address. Looking at me from a hosting industry, we have firewalls uh, uh, inspecting log files or web servers. If you are really abusing a web server, the IP address v4 or the v6 um, subnet goes into a firewall to reject you for a certain period. Now, if you start doing this with CGNet, you could be potentially blocking thousands of users from your servers uh, because they are all sharing the same address. But the problem also becomes is that the address is no longer traceable back to the end user. So it's no longer being able to trace back to a mobile phone on 5G or to a home connection. There will be people saying, ah, oh, this is great, even more privacy. I cannot be tracked, but be realistic. In this world, we also need to have law enforcement being able to do their work and finding the bad guys. So a couple of banks here in the Netherlands, they implemented V6 on their uh, uh, website and on their banking and on their API for the, for the mobile apps because of this reason. Because in 4 and 5G, uh, there's V6 available for the mobile phones here. And on the majority of the internet connections, there's V6 now. So you see ISPs using a CG net on um, fiber or uh, cable connections at home for V4, but then using V6 as well, the majority of the traffic will be V6. So if you're doing something with the bank, and that would be a, you know, a normal criminal not doing what he's doing, um, his V6 address is recorded in the logs at the bank, and they can identify that back via the ISP, ISP to either a specific consumer or a home connection. And Yes, I'm all for privacy. We should protect privacy of people, but there should also be a traceability if somebody's doing something wrong. Uh, and that's what CGNet is hiding. And uh, I, I think that's just going the wrong way. And we also see the European um, uh, Europol saying that uh, they want legislation that CGNet um, is actually forbidden. And so I need to verify this, but I think in, in Italy, it's actually forbidden to implement CGNet because of this traceability, which is lost with CGNet. So, uh, you know, that would be a very powerful regulatory move, uh, I would think. And considering that all of the consumer devices support V6, I mean, well, maybe there's the odd toaster that doesn't support it, but I, I mean, it's pretty universally supported. Uh, it seems like a reasonable move that government could make to, to make IPv6 more widely adopted. And and has that always been the problem with V6? It's this, it's this sort of technology that we know we need. Uh, we know we're eventually going to run out of IPv4 addresses, um, but there has been a lot of, or, or not a lot of incentive to get ahead of the curve and implement. Uh, and so you have carriers like uh, using CGNAT, for example, because it kind of delays the inevitable. Yeah. And that's, I, I cannot speak for them. What's the reason behind it? Um, but I know that on, there's a major telecom company in the Netherlands. Um, I'm, I'm not going to mention them by name, but um, V6 is completely ready in the backbone, front to back. It's all done. I, I spoke with an engineer, but he said, for me, it's just flipping a switch and it's turned on. He said, but there, the other, there's a business reason why we're not turning it on because the back office and the billing system doesn't support it yet. And there's no priority to implement it. Right. Networking wise, he said, I can turn it on tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And that whenever you hear of a situation like that, there, there could be a role of regulators to kind of nudge the industry forward, right? Because it, what a regulator can do uh, is to uh, raise the bar for everyone at the same time in a very fair way, right? You can level the playing field. Uh, and, and so each provider has to do it. They'll prioritize it, right? If they have to do it, they'll do it if they know that everybody else has to do it as well. Otherwise, it's yeah. unfair. Yeah. We, we have the same problem in the anti-spam space, right? Where, you know, until government comes in and introduces legislation forcing email senders to behave in a different way, 
it's just kind of race to the bottom where email senders are uh, using the dirtiest tactics that they can that they can get away with. Uh, and as an email receiver trying to filter spam and phishing, if you don't have that support from regula regulators, it makes your job a lot harder. Uh, but with a bit of regulation like the Canadian anti-spam legislation or the anti-spam legislation that's been implemented in various European countries and the European Union, it started to make things a lot easier. It's made it easier to filter the good guys from the bad uh, by forcing everyone to have uh, a, a higher standard. Yeah. And and also with competition, I, we were talking about hosting companies. So since we're talking about ISPs now, starting a new ISP, so the um, that's, prob that's problematic. You need V4 addresses again. You can get V6. So your, your, your subscribers can get V6 addresses, but you will need to implement CGNet. However, CGNet is also expensive on an ISP part because the routers you need are going to be pretty expensive to do this translation. Um, so yeah, com competition is needed and um, therefore we also should be able to use, um, an ad you get addresses very easily and, and just be present on the internet. So again, that comes back to the concept of fairness and equity uh, in terms of enabling startup companies to compete, uh, to provide hosting or, uh, you know, or to be an ISP, it's got such high startup costs specifically because of IPv4. Yeah. And if you actually look at the IPv6 Google stats and the stats from Akamai, there are many countries, and I can mention France, uh, Germany, um, United States, India, and um, probably Belgium, I, I know they I have more than 50 and some even more than 70% of traffic hitting the Google or Akamai servers is V6 from those users. And what I also noticed is if, if when we enable IPv6 on a website on our hosting company, because the servers will have V6, you'll see that the majority of traffic coming to the website will be V6. So there's huh. this idea of people saying, yeah, V6 is not being used. I said, well, turn it on. If you look at the big players on the internet, we mentioned Cloudflare. If you look at Google, including YouTube, Netflix, um, Meta, all their services, so, uh, Microsoft and, and the, the, the Outlook suite and Teams and such, it is all using V6. Actually, earlier today, it's afternoon, the end of afternoon for me here, I was on a Teams call and I opened my, my open connections on my Mac checking and you know my Teams call was going via V6 because I had V6. Huh. Nobody knows. Right. But you'll see that the majority of traffic going to those big services is V6 from certain countries by just enabling V6. And in India, it's even going much further. There's legislation now saying that ISPs need to have IPv6 implemented in 2024. And I would not be surprised that we will see the first IPv6-only services targeted toward Indian uh, uh, users because why still implement V4 if it's targeted towards an Indian audi uh, audience where V6 is mandatory. Kind of makes you wonder at what if there will be a point in time when a major block of Western countries, uh, such as the EU, will mandate IPv6 on networks. Maybe that's around the corner. Uh, look at the US 2024. I think 2025, the US government in 2023 I think IPv6 is mandatory for any new purchases. In 2024, you need to have V6 enabled in all the government networks. And by 2025, they're going to be turning off V4 in certain networks at the US government. Um, wow. I would need to look up the document, but uh, there's this, this roadmap within the US government. And even some websites of the White House now, the old archives, those are V6 only available. If you want to look at the old website, I think it's from Bill Clinton. It's a V6 only website. Wow. Oh, this is amazing. It's it's almost like if you were a laggard with IPv6, you could be left out in the cold soon by yeah, these and, changes. And that, that's a good thing. I Back in 2008, I, I started using a v6 first mentality. We've been running our SQL databases for v, on v6 only for years. Why? Only our web servers are talking to the SQL server. So why would that SQL server need a public v4 address, right? Not needed. So it has a v6 only address. Many of our internal services are running v6 only. We are managing most of our routers and switches via v6 addresses, their management addresses, simply a v6 address. Why do we need v4 on these systems? And my strategy behind this was always, I want to make sure that we have the knowledge within the company, that we are ready for it. So whenever this moment comes, and I hope this moment would come sooner, but it's okay, it will come. I'm certain of that. 
we're ready for it. And then the competition is lagging behind, dragging their feet and, and trying to figure out how they're going to implement this because they're they're suddenly overwhelmed by uh, this requirement of legislation coming in. And I want to be able to beat that point. And I think we're ready at that moment. So for me, you can turn up before tomorrow. Huh. So how, uh, you know, how does an IPv6 burst design uh, affect legacy systems that are, are still reliant on IPv4? Like what happens when we switch off IPv4 or we mandate IPv6? How do you uh, manage compatibility between the two addressing schemes when IPv6 is really the dominant scheme? Yeah, so the thing is the two protocols cannot talk to each other. And, and the question you're asking has a, diff- a few different angles from which you can <laughs> look at it. I'm looking at it from a data center perspective because home, uh, at home it might be different, but data centers, any router switch you've bought in the last 10 years supports V6, any of them. They, they do support it. Operating systems, Windows, Linux, BSD, all V6 supported. In a data center, it's not that difficult to run on a V6 uh, a deployment. You just need to configure it. The interesting part is if you look at some of the Facebook engineers, which wrote uh, have told the Facebook books, these documents are from a long time ago. They uh, they said we're going to going with a V6 uh, first mentality, and they are only running V4 on the edges on their load balancers. The internal network is V6 only, because they even said that internally the RFC 1918 address space, which is the 10.0, is not sufficient for the amount of servers we're going to be having. So wow. we need to use V6. So they might have more than sort of 17 million IPs addressable inside their network. Yeah. Yeah. That's and crazy. Be switches, routers, right, small right. servers, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. But the interesting part, which I learned from their documents more than 10 years ago or about that time is that V6 allows you to do very cool things. So you take this big subnet and you say this subnet is allocated to that data center A. And I'll take a different subnet, data center B. So based on the address, just seeing the IP address, you can know, ah, this, this device is in my data center at that location. Now, you can take the same subnet and then go into a smaller subnet and say, okay, this subnet is allocated to devices within this room in the data center. And then you can say, I'll take a smaller subnet, which is then usually a 64 called a V6. I'll allocate that to devices in this rack. So if you give me an address, I can then figure out, oh, this device is in data center A in that, in that room and that rack. I know for sure because that's how my network was set up. So you uh, can use it as an identifier as well to actually find your devices. The internet doesn't know, of course, what your allocation scheme is. But if you keep it internal for yourself, finding a device, you know for sure that that address is actually located in that rack in your data center. Uh, yeah, you know, when we were uh, talking about IPv6 implementation at mail channels, one of the challenges that we have, uh, well, I would say probably the main challenge that we have is that we send email for tens of millions of distinct senders. And a sender could be a particular WordPress site. It could be uh, a webmail account. It could be someone's system log generator. Uh, so millions of different entities. Uh, when we send mail, we analyze the message headers to try to determine who the sender is, uh, and we generate a uh, we generate an identity that tracks them. When we were talking about IPv6, we realized you know we could actually take the last few bits of our IPv6 source addresses when we send mail, and we could essentially generate a uh, hash of the sender ID and encode it into those bits so that when receivers receive the mail, they're actually getting traffic from a unique IP address for each individual sending entity that we're sending mail for. And that would give the receivers a way of establishing reputation for each of those senders at the IP level, which would be something really quite new and powerful that has not been available previously uh, in the world of email or SMTP. Yeah, and I'll give you another example, which is kind of similar like this, is right now we're used to giving a web server a single IPv4 address, and then your DNS, you point to that address. But what if you would route a complete IPv6 subnet, a slash 64, which sounds wasteful, but again, we have an enormous amount of these subnets. We're never going to run out. Uh, we're li- literally never going to run out. Everybody can ask me in 50 years, we will not run out of addresses. That's period. You can route this whole subnet, a 64, which is um, more than the whole internet currently has. You can route it to one server. 
Now, if you make your DNS server smart, you can say that I'll give an answer to every query with a unique address. So none of the queries you, you, you send out or the answers you send out to a query will have the same address. This way, if you get a DDoS attack, somebody uh. says, I know, the, I know the address of this web server. I'll start a DDoS at this web server. Then you can simply block the, your firewall somewhere upstream in, any incoming packets towards that address because it was one user DDoSing that address because right. they resolved that. Now, these are the possibilities nobody's thinking about, but you can just hand out a random address all the time to any anybody querying your DNS server. The problem is none of the DNS servers out there currently support this. They want to give you an IP address, but if you would be able to put a subnet in the content of a record and it would just generate a random address in that subnet, this is a very simple patch for any of the modern DNS servers out there. They could do this probably a day of work. Uh, we, we could open these possibilities. Huh. I mean, that sounds like something that a major DNS provider should start doing. Like, I should put you in touch with Cloudflare's CTO, who we had on the podcast in the summer. Uh, you know, they've got the resources to build that kind of technology, and they're already in the anti-DDoS and anti-bot space in a huge way. It sounds so like V6 could be very and useful. And if you do this on your DNS server, if you keep track of in your logging who queries or what answer you gave, so then if a DDoS starts towards a specific address, you also know when the DDoSer resolved that address and used that address in his DDoS attack. So the, the, And then we go back again, traceability. Yeah, you can say privacy on the internet, but this is just you know being a safer, better internet for all of us. Um, being able to communicate and doing stuff like this, talking with each other, that's, you know, that's where it was designed for, right? Not uh, the dark stuff. I mean, I suppose, though, in the same way, the attackers can easily get blocks of IPv6 addresses. Um, and so in a way, uh, because IPv6 addresses are plentiful, uh, the bad guys can hide behind vast numbers of IPv6 addresses and IPv6 subnets, right? Is that behind not- Behind subnets. Yeah. Yet, yeah, that's true. But usually you will get a, a subnet like a 48 allocated. Well, in a 48, you can get 64K of 64 subnets. So what you see now that blocking policies usually go up to 64 or so 48, so it's blocking a whole subnet right. instead of blocking a single address because a single address is, you can rotate within a millisecond to a different address. Yeah, so now speaking of just an area that I'm familiar with it, in the email world, um, <clears throat> nobody blocks individual IPv6 addresses. It's always at the, at the large, you know, the subnet level, like you mentioned. Um, but one of the sort of downsides in the email world uh, of IPv6 is the fact that it's it's free to get IPv6 address space, uh, whereas IPv4s actually cost real money. Um, and so the strategy of blocking based on IP address space that that somewhat works in the v4 world completely doesn't work in v6. Uh, all you can really do is to build up a positive reputation for v6 address space that you know is pretty trustworthy and sends good stuff. But uh, blocking v6 addresses or subnets that are bad isn't that effective. So that's not really been an area of, of tremendous focus in the email world, just because of yeah. this dynamic that the addresses just don't cost anything. Yeah, I do understand what you're saying. So double change the way you, you do reputation on IP addresses. So it will work differently for V6 and V4. But if you look from a technical perspective, V6 is just V4 with a larger address space. Yeah. And I know you mentioned earlier that all the letters and the numbers in there, it doesn't make sense to you yet. But if you look at it, it's just a larger address. That's it. It is not, it's nothing different than that. It just opens so many possibilities. Right. One thing I wanted to say is that you'll be using v6 more than you think sure. and if you have a macbook at home um, uh, and have another mac they will be communicating over link local ipv6 automatically if you have, if you take two iphones and you're using airdrop between them they are establishing a direct wi-fi connection and they'll be using ipv6 link local to exchange information if you have an electric vehicle if you plug it into a fast charging system the car will communicate over IP using IPv6 link local with the fast charger to do communication and then actually initiate a charging process. Wow. So they there are applications for IPv6 that are just emerging because of its capabilities uh, from scratch. I mean, so when your car talks to the car charging system, 
I presume that that's not giving it a gateway to the internet. That's just literally, you know, using the protocol in a in a closed off. A in a closed network. off scenario, yeah. however, the ID within the, it's called the combined charging system. It allows also to you give a public address to the car, even though all the cars have Wi-Fi nowadays. But your home charger would also be able to communicate with your car, give the car a fixed internet connection where it can then download updates or stuff and communicate back without the need for Wi-Fi. So the, the charging cable itself huh. also becomes a data cable for the car. Okay, that's insane. V6 is being used more than people think. And one more example is that the new standard called, uh, I think, matter or threat for um, um, home um, lights. That's going to be using V6 only. Right. Every light bulb. Where I live, um, it's a small community, uh, and the internet comes oh, has to come over an undersea cable. Uh, and several years ago, there wasn't an undersea cable for the internet. There was microwave. And it was the entire village was serviced by a 670 megabit per second wireless link. That's it. And so in the evenings, the internet would become useless because everybody was watching Netflix. Uh, so we we started a group uh, of residents who began working on trying to find somebody who could bring an undersea cable across. And one of the things we did is talk to the power company because they already have an undersea cable to bring electricity over um, in the ocean. Uh, and turns out that they were laying a new undersea cable to provide more electricity, more redundancy for the electric system. And when they run an undersea electric cable, they always put fiber optic into the same package as the power cables because it's made of glass and it doesn't conduct electricity. So they can safely send data across to the other side, which they then connect to the electrical network to collect data, you know, from uh, you know information about people's bills and whatnot, and also to control equipment securely. And so we actually had a conversation with them about, well, could you run internet through your fiber? And you know, we'll tap off and, and run our community uh, on on this internet. And, and unfortunately, we couldn't get it uh, sorted out before uh, the power company had to lay their cable, um, but. I thought that was very interesting, a very interesting little um, insight into how networking is, is literally everywhere. You know, it's in your car charger, it's in the undersea cable. Uh, and, and so we, we've we got a real need to have an addressing scheme that allows us to connect all these devices because the internet is literally in everything now. It, it is in everything. And we should not be always having these big ISPs. You should be able to have a local ISP servicing a small town somewhere which then simply gets a V6 block, is able to address all the homes in, in that small village and have internet there. It is, should not always be somebody from the large telecom companies. A single fiber cable setting up BGP and why not? You're done. You're an ISP now. I mean, believe me, the, you know, we tried. Uh, we really tried to get the local, uh, the town council to support uh, raising some capital to lay our own cable in the ocean because... Uh, we would then have ridiculous amounts of bandwidth available forever for the town. Um, uh, but it was a little bit too science fiction, a little bit too futuristic. So ultimately what happened is is one of the, the two major ISPs just did it. Um, and they charge so much money for an internet connection, but everybody is happy to at least have the internet. So we, we didn't yeah. get that wish, sadly. No, well, maybe, maybe in the future, maybe. If maybe in the future. Uh, maybe in the future. Yeah, and then there's uh, then one of the things I also wanted to mention with B6 is that I can I can talk about this for hours. You probably already understood <laughs> that. I, I, I have a, because we're talking about energy, I have a Raspberry Pi at home, which uh, monitors my smart meter where my electricity goes through. And it has a V6 address. And on my mobile phone, I can simply go to a web page and I can see the actual users currently of my uh, my house, how many kilowatt hours, kilowatts going through, et cetera, et cetera because it has a public address. So just open port 443 on the firewall for it, and that's it. My Synology NAS has a V6 address. It's open to the internet, and I can just access my NAS if I need to. It is um, it is fairly simple. You didn't have to set up a port forward for it through your NAT. No, no, <laughs> no, no port forward needed, no. So what, what happens when a country reaches the tipping point with IPv6. What hap what happens when a country reaches, you know, more than 50% of its traffic going over IPv6? 
I, I don't think a lot happens yet because only the network operators will notice. And I think that's a good thing. End users should not be aware of V6 or V4. It should just be internet, which they're using, right? Uh, but I think it, as it shows up at all kinds of dashboards of, of, you, of engineers, it will also reach the management board somewhere at some point, knowing that the majority of traffic actually flows over V6. And I know that my home connection does more V6 traffic than V4. Not me being a V6 user, but uh, I have a wife and I have two kids which are using YouTube, Netflix, and all these services which are V6 enabled. Right. Hmm. I mean, I, I I can tell you one of the things that I look forward to in an IPv6 only world uh, is that it will alleviate some pressure on my uh, network gateway uh, because actually managing NAT for sometimes thousands of uh, stateful sessions can start to bog down these little routers. Uh, and uh, I've had circumstances where someone in the house is using a ton of sessions, uh, probably for gaming, uh, and, uh, and it bogs down the router. And I have to basically flush the state table in order to you know, free up capacity. I mean, that's kind of like a crazy thing that we just take for granted that's happening in the background to make IPv, uh, IPv4 work that would just yeah. disappear in an IPv6 world. So I sometimes argue that the internet is already broken and we need to fix it, but we're b using so many band-aids everywhere to, 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 to keep it running while it's simply not needed. And um, yeah, so, but for me, it really boils down to education, making sure that people are educated and they make, uh, we can talk on the same level. And as I said, people want change as long as nothing changes. And that's also for network engineers. I think that deep down, some of them are afraid because they lack the knowledge um, and they are hesitant to say, I don't know how to do this. Please help me. So speaking of the transition to V6, uh, obviously large organizations, uh, enterprises, universities, uh, uh, municipalities, uh, they, uh, we, we need to move them into the IPv6 world, but they're often reluctant to do so, perhaps because their their teams are not well educated. But where, how do you prioritize v6 in a in a kind of manageable way? If you were talking to a large enterprise, what would you recommend they start with first in their transition to v6? Let's say you have an office of a large enterprise. Start with your guest Wi-Fi. That's that's the less impactful. So start with the guest Wi-Fi and then maybe the Wi-Fi where your employees are on. Uh, but if you also have some DNS servers running, authoritative DNS servers, get them V6 connected or even your recursive DNS server so they can start going towards the internet over V6. Once that's done, maybe your mail servers, if you have some mail servers running, simply get your uh, inbound MX and V6 enabled so Google and Microsoft can deliver or any other V6 enabled mail server can deliver email to you uh, via V6. Slowly build it out, but um, yeah, don't make it a one-time project. Make it embedded into your company. Implementing V6 is not something you do and then you're done because the same goes with V4. You need to do it and then you're not done with it. But it also make a plan of how you can actually disable V4 for certain services. Let's say all your desktops and your laptops have V6 and you have this file server in your, uh, your corporate office. Why does it need V4 if all the devices are V6 enabled? Turn V4 off, see what happens. At home here, I, I have an, a, a Wi-Fi, I have a different VLAN, which is a V6 only VLAN. Sometimes I switch my phone to this, uh, to this Wi-Fi SSID, which is V6 only, and I can reach my email. I can still use WhatsApp, Telegram. I can use what, uh, Netflix. I can watch YouTube. But some stuff actually breaks, of course, but it's still a bad thing. But for me, it's always a test to see what keeps working. Interesting. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit like the Turing test for AI. Uh, you know, hey, have a have a V six only Wi Fi network that you switch to once in a while to see if we're there yet. And no, we're not. But maybe we're getting closer. Um, yeah. So, it's, what are some real world examples of where IPv six is already really thriving? You, you mentioned some already in our discussion, but uh, you know, give us some examples of of where V six is is already finding very practical uses. Yeah, so we have some background applications for V6, um, but the main driver right now, I think it's in the content delivery networks. As I mentioned, Cloudflare, all the big CDNs, all the stuff have V6 enabled, and they see a lot of V6 traffic coming towards them. 
Um, on 4G, 5G is doing really well. It is mainly lacking on the home subscribers where it is lacking. And then it's uh, corporate stuff running in offices and data centers, which have been built 10 years ago. But on the new modern internet, V6 is thriving and a lot of users are using it. Wow. And, and uh, earlier you mentioned you know, voice applications, like the privacy advantages of using V6, for example, so that you can talk directly, you know, from my house to your house over a direct IPv6 connection instead of having to ping off of uh, an intermediary server because because of NAT. Is, is voice or video uh, a, a major area for IPv6 already? Uh, I know WhatsApp and FaceTime, they try to use peer-to-peer -peer connections if possible. So if you have a V6 hmm. address on your WhatsApp on your FaceTime video or audio calling, it will use a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Huh. And so then you get lower latency as an immediate benefit from that yeah. as well as privacy. I, I, I never did a benchmark between right. V4 and V6, but yeah, in theory, you should get a bit lower latency and better quality of, of the call. So, you know, visualize an internet where, I, I mean, imagine we could turn off IPv4 tomorrow across the entire internet. Obviously, a lot of stuff would break, but, you know, what, what are some major things that would disappear uh, overnight uh, from our data centers, our homes? You know, how would things change if we switched off IPv4 tomorrow? If we will be able to turn it off, I think nothing will really change for the end user. That's the whole beauty of it. Nothing should change for the end user. You should be able to open your app or whatever app, and it should just work. The major thing is that every device now gets a address. It opens peer-to-peer -peer between devices, and we can actually get smaller competition coming onto the internet and coming up with applications which are currently not possible because they are limited by the amount of addresses they can get. They can get. So give me an example of an application like that, that uh, it is really reliant on IPv4 addresses. And so if we got rid of IPv4, this is an application that could suddenly appear. If you suddenly, if you want to run web servers right now, you need v4 addresses. If you want to run mail servers or DNS servers, you need v4 addresses on those. But let's, yeah, if you want to start something where you want to have an app at an API, it needs to have a v6 address um, or v4 address at the moment. Um, some server somewhere and also not being required to go into a big ISP and requesting more v4 space. Being able to start your startup in the basement of your office with a mm. gigabit fiber connection, trying to see if your startup is viable, yes or no, without the need to invest in an expensive data center or cloud provider right away. So maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's actually kind of a way of uh, decentralizing the internet. Um, uh, yeah, we don't think about serving anything from our homes, but the reality is Developers use services like Ngrok uh, to serve applications off of their laptop uh, when they're doing testing, when they're testing their applications under development. And then, you know, N, if you're not familiar, um, Ngrok establishes a tunnel from your laptop up to their cloud service, and then they provide a public IP address uh, that anyone can access, and it, and it sort of gets tunneled back to your laptop. But of course, Ngrok uh, is a venture capital funded company uh, they've purchased a lot of IP addresses to enable that. Uh, in a V6 world, you would literally just put your laptop on the internet and you'd make sure that your firewall permits the traffic and then you're you're good to go. You don't need NGROC anymore. Um, that's it. So, True. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And if I have my, I have a Synology NAS at home and mm -hmm. um, I'm running a small website on there for some internal stuff and a friend of mine needed to access it. I could just, I just send him a link with a host name and it pointed to my NAS and he could just visit the website, which is on my NAS, peer-to-peer -peer connections. And if I would put a Synology NAS somewhere in somebody else's home as a backup of my NAS, they could just sync directly without the need of a cloud service in the middle being able, uh, being there for some translation. So yeah, Angrok not needed, just use your, your laptop as a web server or use some old computer components to build a web server. No need for cloud servers if you just have B6 at home where you can run a web server as the internet was intended. Now, now not everybody is going to be running a web server at home, but nonetheless, uh, you know, for, for consumers, it sounds like there, there will be some sort of secret or hidden advantages to moving to IPv6 in terms of privacy, latency, uh, perhaps reduced costs, uh, because, you know, there's... Uh, you know, people could stop sort of paying rent for their IPv4 addresses, which would make services cheaper. Uh, I have to think that there there must be some IPv4 
uh, land barons that are just making billions renting IPv4 addresses or selling v4 addresses it you know it would be an un, it would be a, certainly a good thing to get rid of those players from from the scene it would make things cheaper yeah I recently was in the process of a acquisition and there was a lot of v4 space um, with this company and and we actually had a discussion about the, the evaluation uh, the valuation of this company because they said yeah we have so much v4 space and I said yeah that's true but you're using only 10% or 20% of it, but the addresses you're using are spread out over all the blocks. I cannot sell any of the blocks. Right. So for me, it's a worthless asset because I need to start a migration process of renumbering all your servers, then free up those blocks and then be able to sell them. It's, it's, you haven't done it. I asked the seller, I said, you haven't done it. So you think it's a lot of work, but now you're asking me to pay up a lot of money. We're, we were talking about millions here. So many addresses yeah. they had. You're asking me to pay millions for these addresses? Well, they are, there, there's no value for me. I just need to run services. That's what I need to do. And so we got into what I thought was a pretty fruitless discussion talking about the value of something which you cannot touch, not even touch. Uh, it, it sounds pointless to me. A cautionary tale for uh, hosting company entrepreneurs looking to sell <laughs> yeah, yes. get your IPs yeah. organized ahead of time. Um, yeah. Uh, so you know, the internet is dominated by large players: uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, Netflix. Uh, you know, you've mentioned earlier in our conversation that that these companies are adopting V6 uh, to a, a great de degree within their infrastructure and also to communicate with uh, their customers. <clears throat> you know, do you think that? The adoption of V6 by these large internet companies is serving as a catalyst that will help smaller players adopt IP, IPv6. Like, what role can companies like Cloudflare and Google play in pushing V6 adoption? I think Cloudflare is doing a great job. All their services are V6 enabled. Whenever you're using Cloudflare, you see that the website is V6 enabled. So that that's a great thing. Um, same goes, of course, for the services Google is providing. If you look from a cloud perspective, the big clouds are lacking a bit. Um, at AWS, it's sometimes it's still an opt-in, so you need to set a checkbox. And when you create a psychological barrier that you need to set a checkbox and enable V6, then some users are like, okay, I'll, I'll just not enable this because I don't know what's gonna happen here. Yeah, I yeah, don't know if I'm gonna break something. Yeah, it might break, so let's not enable it. And the longer you wait with setting that checkbox, then, then it's, it, it's a change, so it needs to go through the whole change process within companies while it should have been enabled by default. Uh, and so that would be my message to people, just enable V6 as soon as possible. Don't delay it and don't make a bigger story out of it than it actually is. Yeah, again, over in the email world, there's kind of an analogy um, uh, in, in terms of email authentication. So we have these great standards. Uh, one of the standards is called DMARC. It allows domain name owners to uh, tell the internet how they want email receivers to deal with failures of domain authentication checks. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, for a really long time, uh, domain owners have not had to be super clean about their implementation of domain authentication because receivers were somewhat tolerant of, okay, you know, a record being broken or missing or whatever. Uh, but recently, Google got together with uh, with Yahoo, um, and they told everyone in the industry, you know, as of 2024, we're going to be enforcing uh, DMARC in a very hardcore way. If you don't have it, if you're not using it properly, your mail will get rejected. And so that lit a fire under everybody to suddenly transition over if they hadn't done so. It gave the people working in the email delivery part of any company uh, a reason to tell their management I need some budget for this, or we're not going to be able to deliver mail, right? So overnight, they really changed things. They they made things better for everyone. I, and I wonder if if these big companies could make similar steps towards pushing IPv6, almost like a kind of pseudo government saying, you're not going to be able to talk to Meta without v6 after such and such a date, for example. Now, not that they'd ever necessarily take that, you know, but that that's an example of what could happen. What Google did in the search engine, saying that if you have sure. SSL enabled on your website, you'll be ranked higher. Well, sure. if Google right. would say, 
If Google would say, if you have V6 on your website, it will be ranked higher. Well, a lot of web hosting companies will get calls the next day from their clients saying, I need V6. But, yeah. but how close do you think we are to Google saying, if you have IPv6 only, then your site will be ranked even higher in the search no, I don't think I don't think we're there yet. That's <laughs> just going to be a long, long period. But um, I, I would like to see these kinds of things happening or, or Meta or Google saying our API will be V6 only by January 1st, 2025. If you want to talk to our APIs, it's going to be a, a V6 only API. Those kinds of things are things which are possible. That there are some benefits is where with v4 you can scan the whole internet as it's, it's four billion addresses within an hour now or even less right with v6 it's simply not feasible and there's so many addresses you right. could never scan them at all no never and uh, there's an l and there's an aspect of random address generation in the v6 standard right so you, yeah you know they're just they pop up all over the place there's no concentrations of v6 addresses in in the uh, in the address space yeah. So I think in the background, we can do a lot of things or Google might say that if your, your email is being delivered to us via V6, we'll treat it better than over V4. Um, I'm just mentioning all kinds of stuff, which, which they could potentially do to make things uh, different. Uh, but I think with our search engine, they have quite a lot of influence. Well, uh, listen, I, I'm sure we could talk for hours uh, about IPv6. Uh, you're, you're one of the, the world's uh, foremost uh, proponents of v6 and certainly an expert in this field. Um, uh, but we are, are coming to the end of the time that we have available. Um, it has been a real pleasure uh, speaking with you, Vito. Do you want to leave us with uh, one thought about IPv6, something you'd really like everyone to take away from our conversation? You know, one thing that they can do to push this technology forward in their organization, with their government, in their home? Just talk about it. Make it, make it a topic. Make it a topic. Keep talking about it. It's, it's a layer eight issue. So it's a human issue. It's not a technology issue. Sure. And don't be afraid. And if you need some help, actually reach out and say, I need some help with this. I don't know where to start. Reach out instead of doing nothing. So the small, the small things you can do on a guest Wi-Fi, starting slowly, but just do it. Enable the checkbox at your AWS Global Accelerator saying, I want to enable V6 on, on my Global Accelerator. Or, and if you see a website without V6, just email them saying, hey, can you enable V6? But I, sometimes I, I get replies saying, oh, sorry, you forgot, we enabled it. It's just that easy. Huh, yeah, maybe for, uh, for 2023, you know, we need uh, an IPv6 day when everybody enables V6 on their guest network. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's a, that's that's a, that's a thing indeed. Yeah, there was of course the World IPv6 Day in 20, 2012, more than ten years ago. Um, as I said earlier, I think it should have gone faster. It hasn't, but uh, we're going there. IPv6 is not going away. Never. Right. It's been a pleasure, Vito. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been great having you on our podcast, and I look forward to seeing where IPv6 takes us in the next year or two. Yeah, Ken, thank you uh, also for hosting me and having me on the show. Um, a great thing. And indeed, we can talk about it for hours. So maybe in a later time again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take care. Okay. Take care.